How many? Ninety-six. Yeah, he said he was going to be listening. Yeah, he called me yesterday to inform me that he would be listening to me. Okay, no pressure. Yeah. It's what? It's to me. Go ahead and start my screen. Yes. Good to go. Ready? All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping items uh, before we get started. Uh, I believe everyone should be muted. So if there's a technical difficulty um, and you can't hear me at any time throughout the presentation, please just comment in the chat box. And um, also feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation in the chat box. We will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation during our allotted time for Q&A. So again, good morning and thank you to everyone for joining us for our second edition of Understanding Kentucky's Target Markets. I'm excited to talk to you all today about the automotive industry, the global landscape, why Kentucky is dominant within the United States, and just exactly what makes Kentucky the ideal place for automotive companies to operate and to continue to choose to locate here and invest in our state. So as most of you probably know, my name is Brooklyn Leap and I've been a project manager here at the Cabinet for Economic Development for just about over two years. Uh, some of you may have worked with me when I was a workforce development project manager and then transitioning over to the business development side. I focus heavily on the automotive sector and uh, just in a few more months from today, you'll also be hearing from me again uh, regarding the aerospace and defense sectors in Kentucky. Uh, I was born and raised in Moorhead, Kentucky, and I'm a graduate of Moorhead State University. A fun fact about my family uh, and myself is that my brother, my sister, and both of my parents are all Moorhead State graduates as well. Uh, prior to my time with KCED, I worked uh, for three years at the Local Economic Development Office in Moorhead, uh, which is where I was really introduced to the economic development profession. As all of you know, we don't necessarily uh, grow up telling our, our mother and father, hey, I want to be an economic developer when I grow up. Uh, so that's really where I got my roots and, and started growing in this profession. I was able to participate in associations, very important associations, such as KAED and SEDC. And that's where I began growing my relationship with the cabinet, ultimately leading to this opportunity that I'm in now. So that's enough about me. Uh, let's jump right into what makes the automotive industry relevant from a global perspective. Just last year, there were nearly 90 and a half million light vehicles sold worldwide. You might be thinking, what do you mean by a light vehicle? Well, this is a motor vehicle that's commonly referred to as an automobile, van, SUV, or truck that has a manufacturer's rated capacity of one ton or less. Next, we see that because of the automotive industry, over two and a half million people were able to go to work every day and put food on the table for their families. 
Two and a half million people. That's pretty incredible. And we know that the average auto manufacturing facility across the world has the capacity to produce 300,000 vehicles annually. And just for some perspective, Toyota's facility in Georgetown has a capacity to make 550,000 vehicles annually. Now, this is a bit of an exception because the Georgetown facility, as we know, is Toyota's largest manufacturing facility in the world right here in Kentucky. And if you think about what all goes into manufacturing uh, and assembling a vehicle, some vehicles require over 15,000 parts to be assembled in order to get to the final product, which is a lot of parts. And this just helps justify that global workforce of two and a half million people. Moving on to uh, scaling down a bit from the global perspective to a national perspective. Uh, why is the automotive industry relevant in the United States? Well, as you can see, for the last five years, we sold more than 17 million vehicles in the country. For five years in a row, we sold more than 17 million vehicles. Now, unfortunately, we know that thanks to COVID, uh, that five-year streak of 17 million or more will be broken this year. However, over the next few years, we certainly plan on uh, working our way back up the chain to get close to that 17 million mark. A $170 billion industry feels nearly impossible to truly wrap our heads around, but definitely just further justifies why the auto industry is relevant here in the United States. And again, instead of saying over 1 million people work in the automotive industry, I like to think of it as the auto industry provides an opportunity for over 1 million people to wake up every day, go to work and earn a living and take care of their families. Another justification for the relevance of the auto industry uh, in the United States is our suppliers. This slide should just give some perspective of how many facilities that it truly takes for the US to be considered a top player in the auto industry. And you'll be hearing soon from another project manager uh, about the metals and chemicals industries, but we know that without metals, plastics, rubbers, chemicals, and machining, the auto industry literally could not exist here. Again, when discussing the relevance of the auto industry in the US, our, our suppliers should absolutely be first of mind. And you'll recognize many, uh, if not all of these companies. And I've put an asterisk and a logo by the companies who already have a presence here in Kentucky. So if you think about it this way, on the list of the top 10 major players, major suppliers in the US, half of them have a presence here in Kentucky. And that's pretty incredible for our state. So talking about suppliers in Kentucky is also a great transition into our next slide, focusing on some statistics about Kentucky that I think you will find to be pretty impressive. Kentucky leads uh, the US in the production of cars, light trucks, and SUVs per capita. And I think this is something that we often forget uh, and sell ourselves short of a bit, but this means that based on our population in comparison to other states, we're the most productive with the number of people that we have here in Kentucky. And as you can see, over 100,000 people in Kentucky have jobs because of the automotive industry. What an impact it has truly had on our state. And on a broader spectrum, one out of every 16 people who are employed in the U United States auto sector work here in Kentucky. How are we able to be so productive? We have over 525 automated, automotive related facilities right here in our state. And here's a picture that will put it into a little bit better perspective for you. So this photo just reiterates again, the automotive dominance in Kentucky. And as you can see, there are auto facilities in literally every region in Kentucky, or as we like to say from Pikeville to Paducah. We'll talk more about the Toyota story and how they arrived in Kentucky shortly, but I want to point out our other two major OEMs in Kentucky. And you may or may not know that the first OEM to Kentucky was Ford in 1913. It began its operation with an entire 17 employees in a shop that was located on 3rd Street in Louisville near Breckenridge. So I'm sure some of you that have joined us today are, are familiar with that exact location. 
and an average of 12 cars were built in a day. It actually wasn't an official factory. It was actually assembly where the cars were shipped partially assembled in crates. And then the 17 employees would do the final assembly to get to that final product. Ford expanded a few different times after their first facility, leading to its current uh, Louisville locations, the Louisville assembly plant and the Louisville truck plant where they make the Ford Super Duty, the Ford Expedition and the Lincoln Navigator. So switching gears to GM, they began production of the esteemed Corvette and Bowling Green in 1981. And since then, they've remained the exclusive, and I do would like to highlight exclusive home for the Corvette. The Corvette exemplifies the definition of innovation, and we all know that innovation is a buzzword that we often use to describe Kentucky. The Corvette is the world's longest running, continuously produced passenger car. And the first Corvette actually rolled off the assembly line nearly 70 years ago, meaning if you do the math, the production hasn't always been here in Kentucky. In 1953, 300 Corvettes were built by hand in Flint, Michigan. A year later, production moved to St. Louis, and then along came Bowling Green in 1981, and they've made several significant investments in Bowling Green ever since. In fact, now over 50,000 tourists from around the world visit the plant on a yearly basis. And did you know that Corvette enthusiasts can actually come to the plant in Bowling Green and watch their very own personalized Corvette being built uh, right there in Bowling Green? And speaking of Corvette enthusiasts, we actually have our very own within our cabinet, Commissioner Jeff Taylor. So just another reason why Kentucky is so dominant. Thank you, Commissioner. Another couple of reasons of what allows Kentucky to be dominant is what we like to refer to as Auto Alley. We are in the center of Auto Alley. It's definitely something that we proudly tout here in Kentucky. And we know that Kentucky is located within a day's drive of two thirds of the US population. Also within a day's drive of dozens of automotive plants in the Eastern US, and wait, there's more. We're also located at the center of a 34 distribution area in the Eastern United States, states, which allows companies to be able to ship their product for just in time delivery. And I've also listed a few of the logos of, of many of our suppliers here in Kentucky that you all might recognize. Low business costs is, is something that we've highlighted for quite some time now in Kentucky and our utility partners are always instrumental in working projects with us for the exact reason of their rates being 21% lower than the US average. They also bring many other resources to projects, not just low utility costs. Uh, I know many of our utility partners have contributed heavily in prepping for site visits and also just making sure that our communities are equipped with uh, what they need to be able to confidently recruit an automotive company to their community. We also know that the cost of living in Kentucky is much cheaper than most states, even falling, uh, as you can see here, 30% below the national average. Moving on to discussing uh, what it takes to recruit an automotive company to your community, uh, we know that most of these categories listed here will apply to every single industry that we work with. But what makes automotive slightly different? The proximity to suppliers and the proximity to OEMs. So it's going to be very important if you don't already to make sure that you know how close you are to specific OEMs and whether you're in the north, south, east or west uh, part of Kentucky, you are close to an OEM somewhere in Kentucky or the eastern half of the US. Transportation costs, be able to understand the types of supplies that the company will be receiving, as well as sending out. If it comes in via barge, uh, will it be cheaper for the company to send from barge directly to truck and truck the product the rest of the way? Or can they utilize rail after barge? This is a question that I get asked very frequently and it's nice to be prepared in the best way possible on how to answer that question. So knowing ahead of time, anticipating what questions you might be asked about transportation costs. 
labor wage requirements. This is not a secret and it's something that uh, we're going to be asked no matter the industry. I would recommend conducting an annual wage survey. I know, I hope he doesn't mind me giving him a shout out, but our good friend Denny Griffin in Franklin does a really great job and, and does a yearly wage survey. And it's always a great tool to present to a company or a site selection consultant um, ahead of time because we know they will be asking. Our internal research team is also great about helping with these numbers as well. So please reach out uh, if we can be of assistance in this category. Utility infrastructure, make sure you know how much of each utility is available at your sites and buildings. If you're working a project where you can't meet the utility requirements, do you have a plan in place on how to meet them? How long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? And more importantly, who's going to pay for it? Also, looking at environmental issues related to the site, be sure that you've done, you know, the phase one environmental studies, archeological studies, wetland studies, et cetera. All of these things will be needed by the company. And we often see sites eliminated because they haven't done these things and it takes time for each one of these. Once the studies have been conducted, uh, did you identify any risks? Are there any issues with the site? Can those risks be mitigated? Again, how long will it take uh, to mitigate, how much will it cost, who's going to pay for it. Having a plan in place and having the answers to these questions will not only save time during the project process and potentially save a project, but it will also just leave a very good overall impression on a company. And speaking of site selection and recruiting, next we'll focus on a story <clears throat> that most of you all are probably pretty familiar with. Many of you know the great story behind how Toyota chose Georgetown, Kentucky. Like I said, this probably won't be the first or the last time you hear it, especially if you spend any time at all with Secretary Larry Hayes, uh, who was a very integral part of Governor Martha Lane Collins' team that successfully recruited Toyota. And while we talk through this, I want you to think about the site selection and recruitment process and how it's still so similar and not many differences at all uh, in 1985 than how we do it today. So Governor Collins and team pulled out all the stops on the recruiting trail. Immediately, Governor Collins knew that we were competing with 20 other states, so Kentucky could not just simply blend in. Uh, she and her team had to show Toyota why Kentucky was different and what made Kentucky so special. So similar to today, we shared many uh, similarities to our competing states around us. However, Governor Collins knew that uh, a quick response time, constant communication, and meeting the company's requests as quickly as possible were all things that could give Kentucky an edge over our competition, just like we do today. And the team reacted quickly to each request for information, and here's the impressive part about this sometimes even hand delivering the information to the company during their trips to Japan. Governor Collins also did not do what we like to refer to as reinventing the wheel, meaning she made use of Kentucky's existing contacts with the Japanese. So KFC Japan uh, sponsored many of the governor's events that she held during her recruiting efforts. And KFC was very well known to the Japanese at this time, and this really just left a great impression on Toyota. However, the state dinner at the governor's mansion might have been just what put the icing on the cake for Toyota. Uh, governor Collins hosted Toyota one evening in October of 1985, and after dinner, uh, the Stephen Foster singers who performed My Old Kentucky Home and were very well known to the Japanese played music for them. And uh, there was also a 15 minute fireworks display after dinner. Another uh, Japanese, other Japanese companies in Kentucky also <clears throat> that had made previous investments here made strong recommendations on Kentucky's behalf, mentioning things like ease of doing business and low business costs. And I know that many of you have probably experienced on site visits 
we often offer the options for the client to meet with local industries to find out an honest opinion in the company's true experience of what it's like to do business there in that community and in the state. Another factor was positive media influence, and this is certainly something that seems to be a pressing issue today. Uh, many Kentuckians did not like the initial thought of having a major OEM build a giant manufacturing facility, and I can't blame them because at the time it was precious farmland there in Georgetown. But when Nissan located in Tennessee, other Japanese automakers uh, located plants in Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, and Indiana, literally all around Kentucky. Kentuckians saw those jobs being created in other states, and they even saw jobs being created here in Kentucky where they were actually supplying parts to companies outside of our state, and, and Kentuckians did not like that. So, for these reasons, Governor Collins was able to present Kentucky as united in our interests and our efforts uh, in recruiting them. And it was so important to Toyota uh, that they were enthusiastically accepted and welcomed with open arms wherever they would go on to decide to locate. Confidentiality was also very critical uh, as it still remains today and as, as you all know. And then finally, the local officials all showed unity on support for the project as well. They were even asked many questions by uh, the site selection team at Toyota and, and many different requests for information came through at, for the local elected officials. And what did the local ofi elected officials do? They followed suit and took the same fast, timely approach as Governor Collins to get them the information they needed. So now we'll move on to uh, a project that is definitely much more recent and actually I, I just worked this project up until a couple of months ago. Uh, so Hitachi Automotive Electric Vehicle Systems uh, will be locating in Berea, although it says a new location, which it truly is because it's a newly incorporated company, they will be moving into an existing building there in Berea. It's a little over a $94 million investment with 165 new jobs projected to be created. This is a joint venture project with Honda. They'll be making parts for the electric vehicle motor. Uh, one thing to highlight specifically about this project is we competed very heavily with Ohio on this. And uh, it's a big deal that, that Kentucky was able to, to pull out the victory because Honda actually has an OEM facility located in Ohio. So logistically, it probably made a lot of sense for this project to land in Ohio. However, we believe that our well-established business relationship that we've had ongoing with Hitachi, between Hitachi and the state of Kentucky for longer than 30 years, was a big reason why they chose to do the project in Kentucky. That, that business relationship has allowed us to have frequent check-ins, uh, just, just go visit them, see how they're doing. We've also worked with them on many workforce training grants. Uh, so constant contact with this company, which is something that we always try to encourage and like to talk about. Again, an existing building was in an exceptional shape in Berea. So there's going to be minimal capital invested on making building improvements. Uh, it's not going to take a lot of time and it's not going to take a whole lot of money. So that was very important to the company. Uh, and then incentives. They did not seal the deal for this project. And the company will tell you personally that incentives did not make the decision for them. While we did you know, do what we could to recruit the company here. We certainly know that uh, it wasn't just a financial incentive decision for Hitachi. Now we'll discuss some of the trends that we're seeing. And as you all know, this is constantly changing um, and we're constantly studying this market and trying to stay on top of these. First, we'll take a look at fleet sales. So fleet sales to car rental companies, businesses, and government agencies can com compromise a significant share of total unit sales for manufacturing companies. So due to the low margin of fleet sales we're seeing, some producers have actually announced their intent to reduce independence on them or to improve their profit margins. So 
if higher profit margins are realized, the public is likely to see higher rental car prices and government agencies, even potentially KCED, will have to budget more for fleet vehicles. Moving on to ethanol, electric power, hydrogen fuel cells, and clean diesel are all among alternative fuel opportunities for automobiles. Most companies currently offer hybrid models. Several companies make flex fuel models that can run on E85, which is a gasoline blend that we know contains 85% ethanol. Extensive research and development are being done um, on all of these different alternatives. So it's constantly changing and we're constantly finding new information. Consumer demand for hybrid fuel vehicles has been high at times exceeding manufacturing capacity, which has ultimately led to the introduction of, of even more hybrid models. And a couple of reasons why manufacturers are producing more environmentally friendly models are one, because of legislation, and two, because of consumer demand. We know that reductions in emissions and noise combined with greater fuel economy all contributes to a greener environment. And a greener environment is something that the majority of companies uh, have committed to and are implementing as part of their business plan. Something else we have our utility providers to thank for is they're already providing solar for some of our automotive companies in Kentucky. I want to mention one that's not necessarily listed on here, but think about aftermarket. So let's just say that if you were to buy a classic car to fix up, just for fun, we can say a classic Corvette, those who have the time and money to invest are likely going to do it the right way and include all the bells and whistles that they can. And with that being said, you might even install, let's say a backup camera into a model of, of car that could be 60 or 70 years old. And, that means that we could and, and likely will we'll see a decline and eventually a depletion of the rear view mirror, especially as safety features become more and more developed. On the other hand, you probably also want that car to have an awesome engine. You want it to be loud and you want others to know when you're arriving. So you might purchase an older model of exhaust system so it can be even louder, quite the opposite of what we're seeing in brand new vehicles today. So those are just two interesting points and, and things to ponder when it comes to the aftermarket. We know that car makers are also making investments in ride sharing and other uh, tech enable mobility services as a hedge against a future that shows less car ownership and more shared ride ship. So think about it as employees have proven that they can be just as or even more productive from home in certain cases uh, there has been, a, been less of a need for transportation, no commutes to work. This means that people will start using micro mobility like bird scooters that you're seeing in uh, urban cities as they won't need to go as far to get to where they're going. And also they're much cheaper than owning a vehicle, you know, no maintenance and uh, definitely no fuel costs. Taking a look at some of the challenges uh, that we face in the automotive industry is we know because they operate globally, car makers are very vulnerable to worldwide, regional, and national economic volatility. We're seeing this now in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, this means that they must remain nimble in order to react to sudden geographic changes in demand. Uh, consumers often delay buying new cars during times of job uncertainty. Again, we're seeing this now. Interest rate changes can also dampen the demand as most new vehicles that are purchased typically have some type of financing involved if you buy a brand new vehicle. As far as fuel economy standards go, the regulations requiring car and light truck manufacturers uh, to achieve certain average miles per gallon ratings across their total fleet vary from market to market. And so auto manufacturers are constantly challenged to improve fuel efficiency technologies while keeping costs down at the same time. And then we have the inevitable COVID-19 uh, that everybody wants to talk about and nobody really seems to have the answer for, but we know 
that COVID-19 is a challenge, but we also know that it is going to absolutely bring opportunities and a renewed interest in reshoring operations and increasing the domestic supply chain here in the United States. We know this. Also some good news. If you think back 10 years ago, we know that our financial system is far more resilient than it was a decade ago. And the revamping of supply chains are now going to start focusing more on resiliency and also how to be self-sustaining. So here we have listed, uh, you know, certainly among amidst these challenges that we're facing, we hope that that you'll reach out to us for your assist for, for our assistance with anything uh, beginning with information about our incentive programs or our build ready sites all the way through what we offer as uh, workforce services. And if we don't have the answer, then something that we promise you is we will connect you to the right resource and to the right person that has the answer for you. So just as a recap, you know, I think we've discussed enough here to justify Kentucky's dominance in the auto industry, but let's quickly just take a review. We know that Kentucky is in very close proximity to dozens of automotive plants, even within a day's drive, allowing for products to be sent for just in time delivery. We also know that it's a fact that, put pretty plain and simply, it's just cheaper to do business in Kentucky and cheaper to live in Kentucky. We discussed uh, Kentucky's production numbers, third when it comes to most vehicles produced, and first in cars, light trucks, and SUVs per capita. And again, we hope that maybe in a few years from now, we'll be able to take that per capita off of there and just be number one completely. And we know that we do not have to reinvent the wheel because the automotive industry is something that has been historically strong in Kentucky and we don't have to create something that isn't already here, which is always great. So now I believe we have some time allotted for Q&A and I have a couple of uh, coworkers here with me to uh, run through some questions that I can hopefully answer for you. Jerry Faulkner, mm -hmm. what do you think is the reason we are seeing the demand in light trucks and SUV? Okay, so the question is, uh, I believe from Jeremy Faulkner, uh, why do we think, what do we think is the reason for the demand suddenly in trucks and SUVs? So that's a great question, Jeremy. Uh, and I would venture to say the number one reason would be low fuel costs right now. Uh, but we also know that uh, millennials and, and much younger generations uh, enjoy doing things outdoors. They enjoy kayaking, they enjoy riding their bikes, they enjoy things that require them to have a small SUV or a small light truck. Uh, also, we know that they like dogs. They might have a kid or they might have a dog or they might have both. So they need plenty of room uh, to be able to uh, do what they enjoy doing. Okay, here's one from Jacob Edmonds. Mm -hmm. In regards to EVs, have you seen an increase in projects related to this industry? Do you see this as a threat to our current supply chain? So in regards to EVs, uh, we have seen I would, what I would call an uptick um, in interest from companies regarding EVs reaching out to us. Um, we know that, and it's no secret, that <clears throat> there are a couple of other countries that have passed uh, legislation and regulations regarding emissions and fuel costs. <clears throat> and as long as fuel costs stay uh, where they're at in America, I think that it's going to further delay uh, the real advancement of EV in the United States. So there's a couple of things, and we know that 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 you not the United States is a little bit behind the game on this, and that's okay. Uh, but I, I don't necessarily see it as a threat to our supply chain as long as our uh, the major OEMs are are doing their research and and improving their technology and staying on top of of things that they need to be doing in, inside their facilities. 
A question from Terry in Boyd County. Are there plans to expand auto manufacturing into Eastern Kentucky? So the question came from Terry in Boyd County. Um, are there plans to expand uh, auto manufacturing into Eastern Kentucky? And uh, I would say that that, that's a really get, great question, but my answer to, to that would be, there's always plans to expand uh, every industry that, that would have interest in Eastern Kentucky, not just the automotive industry. Um, we, we know that there's been some issues, some certain issues that Eastern Kentucky has faced as far as uh, you know, infrastructure when it comes to moving trucks in and out of a facility. So I would encourage, and I'm from Eastern Kentucky, so. So this is an important question to me as well, but I would encourage each community, and, and most are already doing a very good job of this, but if you have difficulty getting to and from a site, you know, if there's not a four lane road nearby, if there's not an interstate nearby, what's the plan on being able to move trucks in and out of the facility, getting them in and out as quickly as possible to make it to their next, uh, their next location for that just in time delivery. So even if you, face that issue. If you can have a plan to show a company of, yeah, we don't have an interstate here, but we do have a great two lane highway or four lane highway uh, that can that can serve vehicles in and out of our facility, no problem. As long as you can show them that, um, I don't see a problem there. So certainly, I don't know that we've really highlighted specifically the automotive industry expanding in Eastern Kentucky, but we hope that many of our industries expand in Eastern Kentucky. A question from Owen McNeil in Mason County. Given the focus on low cost production and transportation costs, as well as state and federal focus on pulling trucks off the road, how much focus will be placed on the river transportation specifically for the automotive sector? Are there ongoing discussions? So, just from my experience, uh, I, I believe that the focus for, on uh, barge and shipping via, you know, river, uh, we see that a lot in the metals industry, which is certainly plays right into the automotive industry and is an important part of that. So, uh, we still get asked. I would say in at least half of my projects, always want to know how close is your deepest water, you know, deep water port? How long is it going to take? Uh, the biggest issue that I've seen to face in, in projects that I've worked is the piece from whether they're shipping products from overseas via barge, uh, getting that to rail and then not being able to, because of the type of material, that they're shipping, not being able to get that from rail directly to the facility. And there's gotta be a, a stop in between from going from rail to truck. So again, um, I don't necessarily think that we've seen a decline um, in barge, it's stayed pretty consistent, uh, but it all comes back to knowing exactly what it is, the types of materials and the types of products that the company's gonna be shipping. Uh, via barge. I think that's it as far as the questions go. So again, thank you all so much for your time and for joining us today. And I hope you'll join us next month uh, for our third edition of Understanding Kentucky's Target Markets. And if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. We have a great uh, internal research team here that if it's, you know, facts or statistics, based question they're always on on top of that and they they do a very great job so please do not hesitate to reach out and i look forward to working with you soon